attack, joining the dots to unmask ugly face of terrorism, which brings to the fore the ugly specter of the rising activities of the Al Shabaab that we're discussing today. And we've been discussing this for the last three shows on how Al Shabaab are gaining traction once more. Where have we slackened as a region that now they're gainfully uh, getting attention and also perpetrating their evil acts? The latest, of course, we know of what happened in Congo as well, where we had one of, of our own here from Italy who perpetrated that attack in uh, the church. This is what we're discussing this morning. We've had also embassies giving alerts here that we should be careful, especially in this uh, stream of time when they are observing uh, Ramadan, almost observing Ramadan, and when we have that ideology that they're doing this all in the name of God. Holy God this morning with Professor Peter Kagwancha, who's the CEO of Africa Policy Institute. Also, we do have with us Ahmed Hashi, who's a governance and policy analyst and we join as well by Professor Naomi Dambo who is a foreign policy and defense analyst as in a partner with Glossop and we have also the director of the whole institute this is Dr. Hassan Kanenja. Before I took a short break I was just highlighting as well uh, the issue of how this terrorism seems to be scuttling the development process especially with the with the lapses many of uh, our citizens are not really aware that projects have stalled there because of uh, the terror attack that is happening around that region. Dr. Kanenje. One of the objectives of uh, any terror group is number one, to terrorize citizens. Uh, but to be able to do that, they have to undertake measures that is going to ensure there is no progress. When there is no progress, it creates more vulnerabilities. It uh, uh, sows the seed of doubt among citizens with regard to the ability of its own government uh, to be able not just to provide security but also to bring development. Uh, they've, been, they've been trying very hard, especially uh, in our northern frontier region, to ensure that uh, there is no progress. That is why for a long time you have seen them target uh, teachers who are perceived perhaps to be coming from this other part of the world, meaning they're not Muslims. You have seen them uh, target those who are trying to put together infrastructure. But at the same time, uh, they're literally extorting business. Remember, a lot of their financing has come from extortion uh, in Somalia. Mm -hmm. uh, pe literally, people pay taxes to the extent where uh, you are even now being asked to pay taxes for next year because taxes for this year has already been collected. You know, and if you don't, of course, there's a punishment to it. Mm -hmm. And that is why, and I think, uh, you know, Prof had written something on it, uh, the, some telecommunications companies were actually used you know, to fund uh, the Al-Shabaab. Uh, the people in the hospitality industry, people in the transport industry, you know, in Somalia, and some actually in this country, of course, are being extorted. And so in order for you to be able to do business, uh, if you're operating in the area which they believe uh, they control, you're going to have to do that. Now, with regard to our own infrastructural projects, including Lapset, yes. Of course, the kind of attacks and using IEDs and stuff like that, it's meant to blunt any efforts to actually be able to complete that. No contractor wants to be operating in an area where you know, the safety of his or her workers are not guaranteed. And so the challenge here, and I would like to speak more to uh, the initial point, what, for instance, uh, Somalia had done in assisting, uh, in ensuring that the community is involved in it. To what extent have we been able to build up that kind of community resilience to the extent that it's actually cooperative with us. Because people know people who plant IEDs. People know those, they live in those communities. They interact with those communities. They even see them planting IEDs. You know. What mechanism are we putting in place to make sure that actually those communities engage and are supportive of our, our national efforts in countering uh, terrorism and violent extremism? And I think uh, we are not going far enough in ensuring that actually that happens. We need to do more because, we, you, you see, you cannot shoot your way out of terror. It is impossible because you have to shoot what you see. What if you are not seeing what to shoot? What are you going to do? Because then that sometimes leads to operations that actually fuels more terror. 
And so what is going to be important is how are we going to ensure that communities that harbor these people actually collaborate and cooperate with government and they take the initiative in fighting against terrorism. Because if they do not take the initiative, we cannot win this war without them. As Prof mentioned, uh, to get a river, yeah, the fish, you have to drain the swamp, get out of the water, you see. So if the swamp is still there, if the water is still there, you know, how do you expect the fish to get out? And I think that's the million dollar question that we need to answer in the next few months if actually we, have, we, we, we are to build a durable lasting peace, uh, especially in the northern frontier as well as even this part, other part of the country where, for instance, there are new theatres of recruitment and, extre and extremism that we're not even paying attention to. All right, maybe you can highlight some of the new theatres that you're talking about that you're not really paying attention to. That would be no, the new theatres, I would say, you know, for instance, within Kenya, we have the traditional uh, theatres which, you know, were associated mostly with uh, Muslim, dom dom uh, Muslim dominated areas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but that is no longer true. Right now, this extremism has been going on for a number of years in parts of Nyeri, in parts of Busia, in Mungoma, in parts that traditionally were not actually known to be producing you know, uh, terrorist, even in Kisumu. Just a few years ago, we had a number of university students, probably close to 100, who had joined Al-Shabaab and ISIS. These are university students from across, mm -hmm. from Meldoret all the way to, to Mombasa. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you explain that? Because it's <coughs> not the traditional f f faces we wow. were used to seeing of, of, of Hassan or, or, or somebody else. Wow. So what, what do we do? Neither, and I do agree, most approaches in, in countering this problem has been developmental. And a lot of it, uh, I always argue that it's because of absence of ideas. Because we focused so much on developmental instead of looking at the ideological aspects of it. That sometimes it has nothing to do with someone's economic status. Because even when you look at some of the ringleaders of some of these attacks, were actually fairly educated people. And not just in Kenya, across the world. You know, then how do you account for that? And so if, if the enemy is dynamic and is changing, so must we to adapt to those tactics and ensure that we actually a step ahead every single day because the moment they get an edge, we lose. All right. So I want to just drop in the aspect of technology because uh, we had a case of Ethiopia as well. I think where Amnesty International was following what really happened, you know, the perpetration that is going on the, some of these uh, platforms that we have with the unicorns, the Facebook, the Instagram, the Twitter as well. And we've seen largely they have been harnessing or, you know, thriving because of uh, the use of technology. But how then do we hold accountable some of these techies that are in the country, you know, uh, uh, but you, you see they're not resident here, as in the headquarters is somewhere else in the U.S., in Ireland, and there is the issue of, uh, you know, the legality of it, holding them accountable because they cannot filter some of this, uh, uh, you know, terrorism, terrorism messages that are being sent, some of these luring of, of these records that we have also from Facebook, from Instagram, from Twitter. How, how do we hold them accountable at the end of the day? They're not really filtering uh, some of this or moderating some of these messages that, that are being channeled through the, the unicorns. Dubal, um, let me bring this a little bit from the global start, standpoint. Then I will narrow it down uh, to the village uh, such that uh, the ordinary person need to understand. That will not take the whole show, like three hours? Uh, yeah, it can <laughs> take a whole day. But I'll It'll take a whole day? Yeah, I'll summarize. Okay. Um, in 1972, at a meeting of the UN Environmental Committee, Mahatma Gandhi described poverty as the worst form of pollution. And I want you to hold that, uh, hold that thinking as we discuss. Since 9-11, the world has learned a lot about terrorism and terrorist act. And so countries like uh, the United States since 9-11, there's not been any terrorist attack from outside, inside America. They are, of course, homegrown terrorism, which is happening there. And so there are two things that happen. What uh, Kananja was talking about Kagwanja and Hassi. One is proactive and the other one is reactive. 
America Homeland Security is no longer uh, uh, at, uh, in New York or entry point to the United States. The, his, the Homeland Security and America has invested incredible amount of resources to capture those people in uh, Bangkok, capture them in Nairobi, capture them in the uh, uh, Middle East before they travel uh, to the United States to create havoc. In other words, every single person that get into a plane on the way to America, they have a complete composite history of who you are, where you were born, where you travel to, who you associated with. The same thing happened in Israel. You cannot get a visa to go to Israel without getting all the detailed information about you before you step in Israel. So a lot of terror that is happening in Israel is homegrown, is not from outside. Now, i uh, give you an example of what I mean by proactive. Poverty, Kanenje, uh, uh, I, don't, uh, Kagwanja, I don't need to disagree with you, but poverty creates uh, co uh, co uh, create corruption and create terrorism. Poverty is the source of the evil which add and develop and impact the whole country. In my home district where I come from, are mainly Seventh-day Adventists. It is a place that people discipline, they go to church, they know who is who. But <coughs> encroaching in this place at the border border, young people doing their business, you know, mean well and all that. One of them became a terrorist among them, terrorized everybody. It's well known. Every time police catch him, where's evidence? Okay, they let him go. So the border border people themselves, border border people themselves, capture this young man, burn him alive, and hang him in a bag and told police, now come and take him. The point is what Kanenja was talking about. It is the people, it's the intelligent, it's the proactive mechanism. It is the knowledge where these people are. And so the information, electronic information we are using is one of the most powerful vehicles. And so to what extent are we committed, are we consistent in following up uh, because when you talk about uh, uh, Dubal, when you talk about Ali, you walk in and somebody flash you and just smile and let you in. What do they know what you are carrying when, where you are walking? So proactive is the most powerful tool that we have to capture these people and be able to now deal with it at the grassroots level. Not reactive. You know, what we are doing in Pokot right now is an example. Yeah, we, we go with brute force. Mm -hmm. We shoot everybody. But what happened to the people, to the innocent people, who are supposed to be partner uh, to you, that need to inform you, that need to give you the information? You turn them into an enemy. And when you do that, then you have more, more terror multiplying by, in, by itself. And so the, what mechanism are we using? and how we're we doing it. And Kenya's all the ability, we have some of the most intelligent uh, 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 people in, in our intelligent community. I will interact with them. I respect them. To what extent are we consistent? Are we using these people? That is the major issue, so that this thing can overcome the whole country and we can see the downward of investment taking place from uh, our investors from overseas. They won't uh, live in this kind of place, mm -hmm. this kind of environment. And that's what terror like. Mm -hmm. well, on the aspect of uh, uh, poverty, I think uh, Kagwanja also had highlighted how, I think it vacillates. Uh, we yes. can't really largely say that uh, uh, poverty is steamrolling, you know, uh, terrorism, because we've seen people from very well-to-do families as well, even from UK, mm. uh, what we talk of uh, Mohamed Mwazi as well, a very highly mm. uh, well-educated young man, and from a very wealthy family, but of course, 
you wonder why he but, will take the route of let, going let, that let way me, at the end of the day. Let me put let me add to that very quickly. On the poverty issue. Yes, on the poverty issue. Yes. We we did a survey uh, with IGAD for almost three months across the nine countries in the IGAD, in the IGAD region. Mm. What shocked me is when I went to Sudan, because we, uh, we, were, we, we were supported by UNDP, which is a development agency, mm. and therefore we had taken a very strong developmental approach. Uh, approach and the main argument was that poverty produces uh, violent extremism. Mm. That was the thesis, mm. until we reached Sudan. And that whole thesis was shattered. Mm -hmm. That among the, the people who had joined ISIS were not the dregs and the, the rumpens of society. Mm -hmm. They were actually sons of magistrates or judges, chants of Cathys, and so on. And therefore, Sudan had taken a very uh, localized approach to rehabilitation mm -hmm. because these are our children. And when they come home, we need to give them what they. They, they, they have what drove them there. Development and poverty did not drive uh, people to ISIS or uh, Al Qaeda. It is actually ideology, and that, that's what Hanenjo was saying. Mm -hmm. It's ideology. But there is an aspect of poverty uh, which you find in many parts of this region. Uh, for example, you are a, a third generation refugee in Kakuma or Dadab. One mother said that my, one of my sons is with Al-Qaeda, the other one has gone to ISIS, and the other one I don't know where he is. Uh, he, is. he had three sons. And the, th the, the, the three sons were born in the camp, right? And they had children. Mm -hmm. So it, the, the big question is that uh, the, uh, I mean, um, settlements like camps and such other degrading uh, conditions of life produces uh, this, this kind of people. Mm -hmm. Yet, when you look at what happened in Mogadishu uh, during the transition, the last transition, yes, Al Shabab was f fighting here and there. It, if, it, came from, it came to us, dawned on us, that um, the Somali people refused to fight in Mogadishu. Mm -hmm. And they waited Farmajo out mm -hmm. rather than fighting him, the way, shooting him out of office. Mm -hmm. Why did they do that? Because they had invested heavily in Mogadishu, in hotel, in, in other kind of businesses that they had started there. And they were not willing to see their businesses destroyed. Therefore, development is actually, uh, you know, uh, security. And, and, and there's no way you can secure your interest unless you have development. So that's where we need to have a more nuanced view mm -hmm. of the role of development in violent extremism. It is not, a, it's not a, a straightforward issue that if you are poor, you, you, are, a, you are a terrorist or, or you are prone to terrorism or that if you are rich, you are immune to terrorism. That, that, that does not apply. Uh, what applies is first to understand the ideological orientation that is pushing people to terror. And second, to ask the question, can the people own terrorism? Of course, what we have invested in is uh, security forces arming them and ensuring that they are fighting terrorists and so on. Mm -hmm. But what happens when people own this uh, war themselves? It means you, you, you win the war without shooting a bullet. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what in Kenya we need to do. In northern Kenya, particularly, mm -hmm. along the coast, we have to get the people to own the war. Otherwise, you can never win. War and insurgency is not won on the war front. It is won on the domestic front. If I can paraphrase yeah. an author of mine, um, <coughs> the, Excuse point, me. the point of modernity, Tabal, is to live a life uh, without illusions, but not to be disillusioned by life. <laughs> um, disillusionment happens in a capitalist order. In Europe, the United States, some people from the high political classes, the educated class, become disillusioned with the political economy of modernity. And they want to seek something from the past and from the hearth of their ancestors or their ideological way of looking at the world. That happens. I mean, there is exceptions to the rule. There's no question that there are certain classes that participate in this terrorism that shouldn't be. Osama bin Laden was uh, drinking beer in Germany 
He had a degree, he had lived in Europe, he had come back, and he became disillusioned with what was happening in Saudi Arabia. He thought that his country was being taken away from him by Western influences. But Professor Midamba's point is, I think, uh, right spot on, because from a point of view of political economy, Dubai, it's not the ideology that is in the martial arts. It is the martial arts that creates the ide ideology. <laughs> the ruling ideas, the ball come from a material world. Um, if we can look at the European school of, um, from Rousseau all the way down to Hegel and Marx, the ideas and conceptions of how history works uh, from the left or from the right, um, there is no question in my mind that uh, the economic indicators are the basis of where terrorism comes from. There's no question about that. And uh, Professor Mijamba obviously agrees with this view. His point is to say that there are marks and disillusionments in areas where you find uh, that the leaders of all the terrorism groups are not from the underclass. They're, they're, they're from, from the elites. The people who actually bring the ideology and do the, the material organization of terrorism don't come from the underclass. They're the Bin Ladens of this world. Um, that, therefore, that we have to pay attention to both these issues in a synthesis in which can produce a public policy about terrorism. The number one public policy about terrorism in the world is very simple. It's very, very simple. The Middle East is involved in the Horn of Africa. It is paying their agents. It is causing terrorism for economic issues. It is destabilizing our African countries. It is what they are doing. These Gulf countries, the devil have been doing. Saudi Arabia's Wahhabi policy has been the basis of much of the terrorism that has happened in the world over. And the Baal, you know why they were doing that? It's because they were protecting their own sovereign institutions. They were protecting their interests between them and the United States. They were protecting Zbigny Brzezinski, the National Security Advisor of the United States, stood at the Penjama Valley saying, Allahu Akbar. The ball, we have to call out this uh, Islamophobic thinking about what this uh, religion thinks about um, the future. It is not right uh, that people are using this faith to get their own ends. There's a lot of involvement in Somalia. If, if Arab Middle Eastern involvement in, in the world's international spy agencies leave Somalia, Somalia will have a state. And Kenya will not suffer from terrorism. This is just facts. I challenge anyone to dispute me and debate me on this. The second thing is the ball is that the massive resources that are in Somalia are in Kenya's interest. They are our neighbors. They are our brothers and they are our sisters. It is us who have to benefit. It is not the Middle Eastern countries who have to benefit from these resources. We can solve our unemployment problems in Kenya by sending two to three million Kenyans to go and work in Somalia. That's our sister country. We are joined at the heart and the hip. This is why I am very passionate about regional uh, cities. I learned friend on the right here insists and if we build this um, common East African home we can have an economy that can sustain us we can have a s education system that is critical we can have a political class that can change our country and we can move forward in this point of modernity that we're living in the ball the point of the matter is to change the Abdullahi in Mandera and come out from in Kiambu to a citizenship who knows what he's doing to a citizen who knows what he's doing we do not want a small elite in this country that knows a lot, and the majority of the country living on one dollar now. We need to transform our economies, Debal. We need to transform our education system. How is it that citizens can access health care? Is when the economy is producing enough money so that the budget can pay 2% for national health care for everybody. All right. That is where we Thank need you. to go. So lastly, Debal, I just want to say it is very critical that we have thinkers in government. I think uh, my, my learned friend, Dr. Hassan, there, he said something very important. You know, Debal, if we just get Sonko to the government, <laughs> you know, Debal, this country is not going to go anywhere. <laughs> it's not, Debal. Uh, we need thinkers. We need uh, critical analysis. We need people. And I hope stature. you're using Sonko, not a Sonko, but Sonko as you feel, is it? Sonkonization. Sonkonization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good to be, to be very categorical. Yeah, well. very so, Sonko is actually a concept yeah, in West Africa. Thug, it's a West Africa. It's West yeah. Africa. Yeah. 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 So there's yeah. this Sonkos of this world, Debal, yeah. um, cannot be the primacy inter pares. Neither can the government have a mindset that accepts those kinds of people. 
neither can uh, the government have this mindset uh, or the opposition is going to attack us so what we need is clever uh, people of the Sonko type to attack them then we're not doing public policy the ball the government has been elected it should do its job should not be busy with the opposition if the opposition wants to go and buy <coughs> in, uh, in, in the city let them go and do it mm. but we have we have to stay stay on the prize and say this is what we want to do uh, this is how we want to go and do it the opposition has something to say about this country they will say it. we can take ideas from them if the government understands it's the government of the people it's for everybody thank you it's not just for a group of people all right thank you very interesting uh, cartoon there that we have and I wonder just to juxtapose what we are talking about today and uh, the cattle rustling that has been going enough is enough and you can see how also the rustlers there they're pushing back the, the boots on the ground uh, rustler makes mockery of the ongoing multi-agency deployment Dr. Kanenja I just wanted to ask you um, if, how did we classify this banditry can we can we say it is under terrorism or is just banditry and if it's <laughs> yeah, and if it's terrorism where then do we have also the role of a national counter-terrorism unit what is its whole function is it just a matter of intelligence or how then do they come in uh, to try and uh, you know <coughs> try and help the situation the way it is right now with the banditry and the terrorism would you classify a, a bandit as a terrorist <laughs> <laughs> You know, we have uh, uh, the, the banditry does not fit under the Prevention of Terrorism Act, uh, and so I don't think it's going to be classified as as, as a terrorist. You know, they are not exactly pushed by Ideology. ideological or uh, religion, yeah. and uh, many a time while they no, are I don't agree with you. Culturally, some of them are driven yeah. by culture. Yeah, by so culture. Yeah. But, how would you say uh, it, it, culture and ideology they're diametrically you know, different those, those, those are different you know c culture you can't really avoid it as in, it's been part of you ideology is something you adopt okay you know but where like do you adopt extreme. ideology for <laughs> no you adopt it, it can both, be uh, is, it, is it not predicated both, on culture both are products of nature yes they are not part of your dna <laughs> yes. so they come okay. from outside you know. that's what i'm saying yes. that's, that's what i'm saying you're saying like one you are born in yes the other one you adopt as you go as you go mm. you're born into into you're born a into culture. culture yeah and you adopt where you were born isn't it no, it, no not necessarily not necessarily that's why i want you to yeah. make it very limited yeah. me as a layman yeah go ahead <laughs> yeah explain no, so that i can understand you know I, I, an ideology is generally you know c created uh, and it can change over time uh, you can have different ideologies within a span of, of 10 years, you know, depending sometimes on who is in political power, what system is prevailing, or what is the fanciest thing that has come, you know, at, at that moment, and then you decide to adopt that ideology. However, culture is something you're born in, you know, and it kind of shapes your worldview and stuff like that. Now, while there's an argument about this being an extension of the cultural practice, where people will go and raid others to steal cattle, you know, I, across South Sudan, Kenya, and Uganda, right? And I think parts of Ethiopia too, mm -hmm. you know, it's something that's been going on. And so we cannot exactly classify them as exactly terrorists because their objectives are actually very, you know, fairly limited. Uh, now, it is true that we have political profiteers who are exploiting this situation to advance political objectives, and they've used that sometimes to remain in power by appealing emotionally to uh, their uh, constituents, but also uh, incident, incident, incidents of, uh, or other instances of arming them. This has been proven that you have politicians who have actually been arming uh, these uh, rustlers to undertake the jobs. Now, this is a problem that is not new, Dibal. It's something that's been going on for a very long time. And uh, as government, you know, ever since, you know, for more than probably 40 years, they've tried different ways of doing it, you know trying to disarm these groups, trying to regularize some of these armed groups to ensure they actually play a more uh, a peaceful role. But what's fundamental here is what are some of the circumstances that lead armed groups to thrive, and that is sometimes absence of government and absence of uh, alternatives to the cultural aspect that is actually harmful, for instance, mm -hmm. in the modern age. 
for many years, uh, these areas have also been some of the most economically marginalized areas. And they tend to be extremely vast. I think perhaps an average Kenya may not understand. These areas are vast. You know, Turukana is probably bigger than Burundi and, and, and Rwanda, Com you know. Combined. Combined. You, you understand, you know. Baringo, they, they're massive. These are huge places. But they don't have enough infrastructure. They don't have enough alternatives to livelihood. Now, with the climate change, it's not helping. Because then the herd and people's livestock is dying in millions, Absolutely. you know. Yes. And so you, you're constantly trying to be able to replenish what you have. Now, unfortunately, we moved from the bow and the arrow into the gun. Mm. So the introduction of the AK-47 kind of changed the dynamic because now mm. that becomes a much bigger threat. When you're using bow and arrows, perhaps the casualties were limited, you know. But now we have, and then we have means of transportation. You know, we have motorbikes, you know, we have vehicles. So we can move faster, which means the, the, the lethal nature of that such engagement is actually greater. And if you just want to know that, I think uh, if all they had are born arrows, we would not have lost a lot of men and women, especially in that uh, part of the world in the last you know, 10 or, or 20 years. But we're losing greater numbers because they have the same you know, type of guns that we're we are having in, in government. So that changes the dynamic. However, this is not you know, a terrorist problem. While they may be conducting uh, uh, massacres against uh, civilians and against uh, you know uh, property. You know we have to be able to look at it as a an act of criminality that need to be tasked now or that need to be dealt with. Now I understand sometimes, of course, uh, some of the noise uh, that sometimes Kenyans may raise with regard to deployment of Kenya Defence Forces because the primary responsibility is protect you know the country against you know external threats and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, what I may also say is um, our different security uh, apparatus, they have different cap capacities and capabilities. There are places where, for instance, the police alone uh, is, going, is sufficiently empowered to be able and you know, has armored personnel, you know, vehicles and stuff like that, <coughs> to be able to go in these places. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, you know, as a country, we've not developed sufficient capacities that, let's say, all our agencies involved in security can actually be able to take all type of of operations and I think that is why perhaps you're seeing the president asking the military to be able to undertake certain things uh, in part because they uh, they have certain uh, equipment that is going to make it easier not just on the ground but <coughs> mentoring from the air you know so approaching it it has to be seen as actually trying to stamp out a criminal organized crime kind of group but at the same time I think the long-term solution thank you mm -hmm. is going to be have people shift from these cultural habits of actually using violence as a means of economic survival. Right. Actually, my main point was uh, not really to take the boundary uh, way of discussion that uh, the KDF is on the ground, but to bring the, 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 to, into perspective the role of the National Counterterrorism Unit uh, with, with their strategy that they've launched so far. How do they play in tandem with uh, you know, the current state of play? Uh, where we have the resurgence of Al-Shabaab, do they need to reconfigure their strategy? Uh, are they meant to be millimouth and working undercover so that we are not aligned with what they're doing as a public? Or where is our place when we want information from the National Counterterrorism Unit? Or oh, these are, are very covert activities. We'll come to you, Professor. Uh, no, there is nothing covert about National Counterterrorism Unit. National Counterterrorism uh, Center, for instance, it does not have a separate military or police. It coordinates all the agencies that are actually involved in fighting terrorism. And that is across a section of security agencies as well as other agencies that are critical in contributing to security. You know. And so, any time you're going to reach out to the National Counterterrorism uh, Center, what it's going to do is going to be able to inform the appropriate uh, organ to be able to deal with that more efficiently because its function is actually to coordinate these efforts. It's not to send a contingent. There is no barracks or, or a battalion that is headed you know, by the NCTC. However, it is more uh, better placed in coordinating these activities. And that is why we always encourage Kenyans because sometimes you, you know, someone sees a terror-related problem. Now, of course, the first action is, and temptation you know, is to report to the, uh, to, to the local police. And that is wonderful. The challenge sometimes is 
sometimes that immediate police might not really understand how to deal with that problem. And that sometimes has created problems between the police then and the community. But because this is a limitation manner. we know as, as a public. Yes, because of the manner in which they're not exactly trained in this. And so that is why NCTC probably is going to send more appropriate persons in terms of contacting them to deal with it. Sometimes that reporting puts you at risk because then the police will come and say, hey, so-and-so said this, now we're arresting you. And what happens next? Your family is killed. You understand? And, and, and that has actually been a problem uh, <coughs> countering terrorism. And that is why I think it's going to be very important that, you know, and, and how, how NCT should be reaching the information is actually in the public. You know, they, they, they have the public number, they have a toll free number that someone can call. And most of the time they're going to respond on a timely level. And that is why I think it's going to be helpful. However, if it's an immediate threat, I think just report to the local police. And no matter how dissatisfied you may be, it's always going to be important. We know that there is, a, there is a tension sometimes between the community and, uh, and some of our police, you know, uh, you know, officers. But you do not have any other uh, way, especially if the problem is immediate. If it's not immediate, we suggest you actually report to NCTC for them to be able to launch some investigations and know the appropriate mechanisms of intervention. Oh, about accessibility to NCTC, I, I doubt if uh, that is entirely accurate, that the information truly is out in the public, because most Kenyans are not even privy that we do really have a national counterterrorism unit. And uh, what is the appropriate way to report? Is it the police or the hotlines for the national counterterrorism unit? So I think even from on that particular note, they've not done a good enough job to try and publicize themselves. And this, this in information of secrecies, uh, on your protection, on your bugbears and fear you that you want to report so-and-so has some very mischievous activities as a neighbor. In the spirit of New Makumi, they've not done a sterling job. And they should maybe pull the ante in terms of making sure that at, at least Kenyans are aware about the National Counterterrorism Unit. Mm -hmm. Professor Nomida. Uh, uh, again, since 9-11, uh, Americans, uh, citizens, uh, have become fairly uh, sophisticated uh, about what is next door, uh, what is coming, how do you look, and those kind of things, and where to report and all that. But even with majority of Americans uh, that are averagely educated, they don't know these things. So when you're talking about a villager, you know, first of all, when you talk about counter-terrorism, they don't understand what what are you talking about, mm. and and so 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 what we tend to do is we tend to be reactive to a consistent problem that has taken years. This is a cultural, and secondly, we know that there is going to be impact of 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 weather. We know that, and we know that when it comes to time, that cattle don't have water and people don't have food, there is going to be reaction. What is it that we have done to bring these people together and to understand the fundamental basic problem such that we can be able to deal with it, from a, address it from a community standpoint, and then address it from law enforcement standpoint? What is the role of, of, of military? Um, General Powell said that military people are warriors. They're trained to kill. They're not trained to massage people. They're not trained to babysit people. At what point do we use the military and also use the police? And so these are the kind of questions that has to be answered nationally, transparently. And, and so what is happening, for, for instance, in Pokot, is tragic. It is simple. The intention is right. Let's go and, and quell the, uh, the rustlers and everything. But they multiply. This has become a gun culture. And there are millions of guns, you know, small arms that are, that are coming in, into the system because there is a, pro, uh, a problem. So we are not helping when we react and then get back and life is normal. So, what I want to say is whatever we have, we need to have enough intelligence and we need to have the cultural 
relationship, Nyumbakumi, as you said, has largely failed in most cases. People don't know what, what is it, what Nyumbakumi does. All I know is people complain about budget, budget. We don't have enough budget, so we can't do it. But the issue, this thing is not going to go away overnight. We need to be consistent about it. All right, so, we need to bring this to a close. Add one, to one, just one little point, if you don't mind, then I'll give it to Kwanja. No, no, let me, let me okay, come to enough. Professor, then I'll come to you. Well, I, I think the problem we have in North Rift, or in this area of intervention, uh, is not lack of goodwill by both governments and existing institutions. That's mm -hmm. not what we have. It is actually going to a situation blindfolded, without sufficient knowledge of what it is that you are going to do. <coughs> Excuse and the question you have asked to debunk yes. is point on. Because you're asking, is banditry terrorism? Mm -hmm. And therefore, what is the appropriate agency to intervene, mm -hmm. given that we have laws that mm -hmm. govern who can and who cannot intervene? So, in a sense, although you focus too much on the counterterrorism uh, unit, uh, the, the, the point is you are raising the fundamental question of whether we have, we have sufficient knowledge about what it is yeah. that we are intervening yeah. in. Yeah. Now, yeah. in the Kenyan, I mean, in, internationally, we are already told, if you read Eric Hobsbawm, the British scholar, the primitive rebel, uh, and, the, the, and what he calls the origin or archaic forms of social movements. So uh, these bandits represent opinions of people. So in a sense, they are actually social movements. And you need to understand them as that they're not just criminal movements. Because the Pokot, I listened to one of the Pokot speaking yesterday mm -hmm. and said, we and the Marakwet know how to do, we fight each other mm -hmm. and then we come to an understanding that we have to stop fighting. Mm -hmm. This is what he was saying, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, the problem with the intervention of the military is that it's preventing us from fighting mm -hmm. so that we can get to a solution. Mm -hmm. and this is their own way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. Let me finish, Hassi. Now, when you read Donald Crame, Bandit Rebellion and the Social Protest in Africa, which focuses on the, on the Horn of Africa. Mm -hmm. His main argument is very simple, that banditry is a social movement and that there are legitimate societal backing of, this, of these things. Therefore, you need to understand that when you go to look for the bandit, you might as well be fighting the entire community. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you are mobilizing against yourself. Mm -hmm. That's the point. Here in Kenya, the word bandit actually means terror a ter terrorist. The, the, the shifter, oh, mm. the yes. shifter was a, was a, was a bandit. bandit. The, 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 the Somali equivalent of a shifter mm. is a bandit. But <coughs> Katorasuling is a different animal, mm. totally different. Because communities in the north, uh, whether there is drought or no drought, there are marriages and all, for cultural reasons, have down such centuries, uh, raided each other for goats, you know, camels and uh, animals and so on. But the next season, then we go and read for the same animals. Mm -hmm. The whole culture of wrestling has changed because it has, we have now commercialized wrestling. By the time you are wrestling, already the trucks, you know, uh, trucks are there to carry those things to Dagoretti and other markets in Garissa. Mm -hmm. So what happens? What we are seeing in the North Rift, and which is likely to spread it to other parts of the drier parts of the, uh, the country, is a complex mix of terrorism, which is banditry, mm -hmm. a culture in terms of wrestling, and criminality arising from now wrestling as an economic gain. You are basically stealing from poor communities in order to sell your cows to Nairobi uh, and elsewhere, the, the lucrative markets. And therefore, if you don't get a nuanced understanding of this, deep knowledge of the complexity of these matters, and then you deploy, whether it's a police, GSU, military, or whatever, you're making a mess. Yeah. You just need to have a clear knowledge of this. And some, some of the reasons might not be as rational mm -hmm. as you'd want, because we live in a society, modern society where rationality is the issue. Sometimes you have to read some of these cynical books like Africa Works and look at the role of other cultural drivers. Rationality or things. irrationality? Uh, yes, that's sometimes, the question. The sometimes the, it's the, irrationality I that works. This. Yes. I think this let him finish, let him finish, you finish. So I, I, I'm kind of saying that uh, nuanced understanding of some of these deeds and what is driving them is important. And if you are looking for rationality, sometimes you are not going to get it. If you are looking for the rule of law, 
in some of these areas, you are not going to get it. The Pokot warrior holding AK-47 and a whole range of bullets mm. is saying, the military is preventing me from dealing with the, uh, the Marakwe so that we can settle this out and become friends. What is he trying to say? And he says, we have done this for centuries. So there must be some irrationality that is driving some of these wars, which may not, we may not understand. All right. Uh, we bring it to close. Hashi? I think that the ball, we sh our response should not be that of Sir Evelyn Baring. There's three books, how to pay the salaries, how to hit the native, and how to employ police officers. This is from the colonial, uh, the colonial part. Just the truth, uh, you know, the crossing over the truth. So the, the civil administration goes to the library to say, what did the British do with the Turkana and the Pokot? Or they sent the um, Irish fusiliers to go and shoot them. So we have now, we have become the fusiliers where we're put on the dress and go and do the same thing. The ball, what we need in northern Kenya is more devolution so that we can have more development, we can have more schools, we can have more hospitals, and we can create the free market and create people to get jobs. The ball, when they shoot the you know, head of the FBI in New York, the entire United States Air Force does not bomb Kansas. You know, we have to think differently, about. We cannot think uh, that we're going to take all the camels of the Somalis so because one guy, one shifter guy, shot a, a chief. Uh, we, the responses that we have, the ball, uh, uh, well, that's why I was coming back to Kagwanja's point. I said that we need thinkers uh, about public policy in, in the system. And we need to create the uh, new policies uh, opposed to the ones of Sir Evelyn Baring. Um, and if we continue thinking of collective punishment as public policy, and we have to say that the Pokot and the Maraqueta don't listen. The only thing they understand is shooting. Um, at the end of the day, the ball, you know, the guy in, Pokot, in Pokotland who's looking at um, Ruto, uh, he doesn't think it's the Kenya army that uh, is uh, attacking him. He thinks it's the Kipsigis. All the 90 who are attacking him because their commander in chief is the president. That's how he views it. He doesn't view it as the president trying to protect the. That's just the truth. That's just the truth. Yes, sir. And then, you know, so the ball, we have to have a different way of approaching public policy. And I think that uh, security is important. Killing a senior police officer in this country is not acceptable. We're going to catch you, we're going to put you in jail. But, you know, we have to use the needle, we have to use intelligence. We have to use those things. At the end of the day, the, but the material worldview of northern Kenya has to change. Why are they not arresting these politicians, these governors who have stolen all the money from education and healthcare? And why do they want to send armored personnel carriers to these illiterate herdsmen in uh, northern Kenya? It is a class issue. The political elite are responding to their sergeant at arms being shot at. Mm. All right, on that particular note, we take a short break. Mm. Mm. When we circle back, we want to see uh, and follow up what is happening in uh, Ethiopia with the uh, AU summit that is ongoing right now uh, right. in mm. Ethiopia. Mm. <laughs> and we have also <laughs> President Shisekedi was pushing for Rwanda censure. He spoke also during the summit. So we want to look at the M23 backers uh, whom he wanted uh, or he wants reprimanded. And uh, the, also the East African Force Mandate Review to include combat as well. So we'll be looking at the AU diplomacy. Don't go away. Much more coming up on the other side of the break.